we've arrived at the mystery of the Holy Spirit. So we did some creative kinds of classes uh, with a liturgical year and that sort of thing. But if we were following exactly systematically topic by topic, um, we would have moved from the person of Jesus, which I think we did three nights on the person of Jesus, to the Holy Spirit. We talked about the mystery of God before we even talked about Jesus. So tonight we're going to be looking at the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. And I always have this intuition that for the majority of Christians, including Catholics, um, I suspect that we probably feel more connected most of the time to God the Father or to Jesus than we do the Holy Spirit. So how many of y'all find yourself in that boat? Uh, you feel more connected with the Father or the Son. How many of y'all feel closer to the Holy Spirit among all the persons? Okay, a few hands, okay. And uh, so uh, there is, by the way, in the Catholic Church, a movement called the Charismatic Movement or Renewal. Uh, it's been very active for about half a century. And it emphasizes very much the Holy Spirit. Uh, our brothers and sisters in the Pentecostal churches emphasize very much the Holy Spirit. So when you're in any of those places, the Holy Spirit has great prominence. So, uh, but I think one of the reasons, by the way, that the majority of us do not immediately connect with the Holy Spirit as much is because when we talk about God being our Father, almost all of us have some conception of fatherhood because we have fathers and we know fathers around us. So when we think about God as father, we're always thinking about God in terms of some form of fatherhood, however it needs to be purified. Uh, in terms of Jesus, we have four Gospels about his life, and for 2,000 years now, he has been depicted in all forms of art in Christianity. So uh, most of us have a very vivid portrait of Jesus that we carry around inside of us based on all the Gospels we've heard, based on all the paintings and images. And I dare say, probably, uh, if I asked you to close your eyes and picture what Jesus would look like, you probably have a picture that speaks to you of who Jesus is. Uh, the one, and it's paradoxical, but the one that, that I've always connected with is often called the Search Jesus or the Curseo Jesus. You know, it's the one I open my eyes to it. Yes. Okay, that's what Jesus looks like in my brain. So, even though we have an artistic tradition that has many ways of, of depicting the face of Jesus. By the way, we don't know um, precisely how he looked because there were no photographs or artistic repre representations of Jesus during his lifetime or by any of uh, those who saw him uh, in real life. So, uh, we extrapolate based on uh, what men and the, and the Middle East looked like in those years. And there would have been a variety of looks, just like there are a variety of looks today. So, um, so, so the Holy Spirit, though, is a bit more mysterious. We don't have a clear conception. So if I asked you to close your eyes and imagine the Holy Spirit directly in front of me, what would you picture? Or a dog. Right, so, yeah, and the Spirit of God is depicted, especially in the New Testament baptism accounts, in the form of a dove. Uh, it's interesting because Mark, in his speaking about how the Spirit descended on Jesus, says that the Spirit descended as a dove would descend. So it doesn't necessarily mean that in Mark or in Matthew that the Spirit appeared in bodily form, but as a dove would descend, so or came down, so, would, so did the Spirit. Luke in his Gospel clarifies and says that the Luke, that the Spirit descended uh, in the bodily form of a dove. So Luke wants us to picture the birth, uh, not necessarily Matthew and Luke, or Matthew and Mark. So um, anybody have any other depictions? If I said picture the Holy Spirit, what does the Spirit look like? Light. All right, light, fire. And fire is an image, by the way, associated with the descent of the Holy Spirit on Pentecost Sunday. So tongues as a fire, Luke tells us in the Acts of the Apostles, descended upon the apostolic community. So, yeah, some people, when they think of the Spirit, think of fire. Uh, any other images or metaphors? Or being embraced. Okay. 
Very interesting. And I don't know that that's in the scriptures. But uh, another very profound symbol of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost was the driving wind. So the spirit like a wind or a breath. And there have been moments, by the way, when I've been outside and the wind is blowing around in the trees and the trees are moving in the wind, that I felt like I'm in the presence of the Holy Spirit. So the idea of wind and spirit are connected. And we'll talk a little bit about that, actually. So, uh, how many of you all have seen that film, The Shack, or read the book? Okay, so, yeah, so um, the film, by the way, does an interesting job of depicting the person of the, the persons of the Trinity, and the Holy Spirit is depicted as an Asian woman uh, who kind of sparkles as she moves in the light. So, uh, it's a very interesting way of depicting the mysteriousness of the Spirit. And it's interesting because the word for spirit, ruha, in Hebrew is the feminine form of the word. So sometimes the spirit, therefore, has been associated with uh, a more feminine approach to God. So the, the depiction of the spirit in the shack as a woman actually does pretty well. By the way, is God a man or a woman? Male or female? Well, if you answer since the incarnation, the second person of the, the second person of the Trinity, Jesus, is definitely male, a man. But God Himself uh, transcends all human sexuality. So God is neither male nor female. So in Genesis, both men and women, male and female, are created in the image and likeness of God. So it's no more proper to say God is a man than to say God is a woman in the essence of God's divinity. God transcends. Uh, human sexuality. So both of us somehow, uh, the sexes that God created, male and female, we reflect who God is. So, uh, so, and it's interesting because even though we speak of God as Father, uh, many of the qualities of God, uh, in both the Old and New Testaments, are what we would call very maternal qualities, in fact. So, uh, so I often, by the way, because the Spirit and Hebrew is in a feminine form. When I'm speaking about the Holy Spirit, I'll say, she is guiding me to do such and such, rather than he is guiding me to do such and such. It doesn't bother me when you say he, because we do it in our liturgical language all the time. But, um, but an openness to the mystery of God uh, in that way. So I want tonight to reflect a bit first upon this mysterious presence of God, this person of the Trinity that sometimes we don't think about as much. And um, so in Hebrew, the Spirit of God uh, are the words Ruha Elohim. And so Ruha, the Hebrew word for spirit, is the same word that the Hebrews use for breath, like the breath that we breathe, and also the same word for wind. And when you use the phrase together, Elohim, which is the word for God, the breath or the wind or the spirit of God, uh, that connected set of words together were also the way that they spoke about a great storm, a mighty or a strong driving wind. So in the beginning of the scriptures, do you know the very first place that the scriptures refer to the Ruha Elohim, the spirit of God? Breathed over the waters. Spirit breathed over the waters. Okay, over the waters. So, yeah, we'll go to the very beginning. If you have a Bible with you tonight, I want to peek at it. Uh, I'm looking at Genesis, first book of the Bible, chapter 1, verse 1. So, the very beginning. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless wasteland. Hebrew, tohe wabohu. A chaos, a watery mess, and darkness covered the abyss. While a, this is the English translation in the current New American, while a mighty wind swept over the waters, the Ruach Elohim, the Spirit of God, hovered, or a mighty wind hovered over the waters, over that chaos. So uh, even though our translations uh, correctly translated as a mighty wind, it's the very same word for the Spirit of God, Ruach Elohim, which, as we Christians, we can look back 
and say there at the beginning when creation was begun already before creation was the Ruha Elohim, the Spirit of God. And then God said, let there be light. So creation begins with light. But there's a reference to the mighty wind or the breath of God, the spirit or wind of God, uh, moving over the face of the waters before God spoke. And when God spoke, we have word. What is the word of God made flesh in John's gospel? Jesus, the Son of God. So we Christians look back at that moment and say, ah, our Hebrew ancestors, ancestors would never have read Genesis that way. But we Christians look back and we say, here already, you can see hints of the Trinity, God, the Spirit, and the Word. And John's Gospel, by the way, will make that explicit with the Word. The Word was with God, the Word was God, and this is before all things were made, then the Word became flesh. So I like the fact that, and by the way, in the Old Testament, we'll hear some important moments when the Spirit of God is present. Our Hebrew ancestors would have understood that much like when we talk about the love of God or the power of God or the uh, uh, wisdom of God. So they would have seen it as one of the personifications of God. They would not have regarded the Spirit as something distinct from Father and Son as a person. But we, looking back with the glasses of our Christian awareness of Revelation, can see foreshadowings, hints, of the mystery that will be revealed in Christ, already present at the beginning. So the first hint of that is at the beginning of Genesis. Does anyone know when the Ruha appears a second time after that pivotal beginning moment? <coughs> or it's still in Genesis in the very beginning? <coughs> Actually before Abraham. So, it's the second creation narrative, which is from perhaps a more ancient author than the first, priestly author, and I'm looking at chapter 2, verse 8, uh, or verse 7 actually, I'm going a little bit ahead. Uh, the Lord God, uh, there was a stream of somewhere, the Lord God in verse 7 formed man, Adam, out of the clay of the ground and blew into his nostrils the breath, the ruha of life. And so man became a living being. So it's by the spirit, the breath of God, ruha, that comes straight from God, breathed into the nostrils of the human person, that we become a living being. So I, the, the beauty of this, by the way, is that the spirit of God then in Genesis is portrayed as being present in the very act of creation, but in a very intimate way uh, with the creation of the human person. So, uh, how many of y'all have ever had the experience of trying to do uh, uh, resuscitation, where you're trying to breathe a breath into someone, or receive that? So, it's a very intimate gesture, isn't it? That God would shape humanity, he's like a clay, a potter, shaping humanity from the clay of the earth, and then breathing into the nostrils the breath of life. So our Hebrew ancestors understood that it was by God's breath alone, this ruha, his spirit, that we lived. So when we lost our life breath, our life returned to the clay from which we came. So the breath was connected with the very life force that God had given humanity. So the spirit of God uh, will show up at key moments. Uh, one of the very profound moments, by the way, uh, happens with Moses in the book of Numbers. So Moses has been leading God's people, and I think it's his father-in-law comes to Moses and says, Moses, this people is too much for you. You're going to wear yourself out. You need some assistance to help you. And 70 elders are selected, and um, in Numbers chapter 11, they select the 70, and uh, those 70 that are chosen to assist Moses, it says the Spirit of God came down upon them. The Ruach Elohim. So they help those leaders of God's people to shut up. Uh, now, the story is interesting, by the way, because two of the people who were part of the 70 didn't show up where they were supposed to. They stayed back where they should not have stayed, Eldad and Bedad. And guess what happened? They got the Spirit of God too. 
And some of the other people said, wait a minute, they weren't where they were supposed to be, they were with us. They should get the spirit. And basically the response that biblical text is implying, God gives the spirit to whom God wills. And it reminds me, by the way, of the New Testament where someone says to Jesus, you know, we've got to stop those people. They're prophesying in your name and they're not part of our company. And Jesus says, if they're not against us, they're with us. Don't try to stop them. So this idea that the Spirit of God is sort of beyond human control, uh, beyond our ability to manipulate it, like wind. You know, the wind that Jesus will say in the Gospel of John comes and goes where it wills. So too does God's Spirit. It's not capturable or containable. So the idea of God's Spirit being active uh, shows up in a very profound way in the early history of Israel. So the judges, who were the original leaders of God's people, charismatic leaders, uh, the text will tell us that the Spirit of God sees them. So if we look at the, one of the famous judges is Gideon. So in Judges um, chapter 6, Uh, Midian and Amalek and all the Kedamites mustered and crossed over to the valley of Jezreel where they encamped. The Spirit of the Lord, Aruha, enveloped Gideon. It seized him, it will say in some translations. It enveloped Gideon. He blew the horn and summoned Abiazar to follow him. He sent messengers too. So sometimes God would send his spirit upon an, a particular individual that God wanted to use for some important purpose, uh, to lead his people at decisive moments along the way. Probably the most famous instances of the Spirit of God uh, were the kings of Israel. By the way, in the beginning, Israel had none of its, had no kings. Uh, why was that? Why didn't they get kings? Because God was king. Or because God was their king. And do you know when they get the first king at Saul, do you know why they got the first king? They started looking around at all the nations around them, and they all had kings. And they said, we want a king like all those other nations. And God said, I am your king, basically. You don't need a king. They said, yes, we need a king like all the other nations. And God said, fine, let's try it out. So, and by the way, if you follow the history of the monarchy in Israel, it didn't go very well 99% of the time. So the first one, Saul, he is, seems to be a man after the Lord's heart. The, the Spirit of God seizes him and rushes upon him. But at some moment, Saul begins to turn in on himself. He becomes highly self-destructive. And then he becomes a poor leader for God's people. The second king of Israel, David, the Spirit of God rushes upon David too. He's anointed and chosen by the Spirit of God. And when Israel looks back at their whole list of kings, David is always the greatest king. He's their hero. And many of the texts of David reflect that idealization of the perfect David. But it's interesting because even the most idealized portraits of David in the Old Testament do not hide the fact that David had severe shortcomings, uh, including adultery and murder uh, of an innocent person. So, uh, so when you read the text, but the remarkable thing about David is even when he does terrible things, uh, he experiences very profound repentance. So you have these powerful moments. And then how many of y'all have read those, those, the stories of the kings of Israel in the Old Testament? When you read it, it's a bit disheartening, isn't it? Because a new king comes along and you think, this one's going to be better than the last. And some of them are better than the others, right? Hezekiah, Josiah, and so forth. But almost inevitably, they all start falling short. It's like, you know, they start going after other idols, and, you know, they start destructing in different ways. So none of them seem to do a very good job. Even Solomon, you know, who's uh, renowned for his wisdom, in the end also has a dimension of himself that is highly destructive. So it's almost without fail that the kings of Israel, though called by the Spirit of God, proved that God was right, that we shouldn't have tried to choose our own king but let God be king. So, uh, but God's plan and purpose always include those kinds of things. And he's moving us toward the true son of David, as we all know, uh, the true king of Israel, uh, who is Christ the Lord. So 
you know, and all these imperfect preparations were being prepared for the true shepherd of God's people. So uh, the other people who speak about, uh, the scriptures speak about the Spirit of God coming upon them are prophets. And the prophets are those who speak the truth of God to God's people and to the leaders of God's people, particularly when they don't want to hear it. So the prophets will come along and speak the unpleasant truths to the kings of Israel, uh, that they are not after God's heart. And uh, Isaiah, by the way, in a beautiful passage, uh, speaks about qualities of God that we still refer to to this very day. So in Isaiah, uh, I find it, chapter 11. Isaiah says, and we heard this a lot, by the way, during Advent, but a shoot shall sprout from the stump of Jesse. Who's Jesse? David's father. That's David, King David's father. So Jesse's the, key, the father of King David, and Isaiah speaks about Jesse as an old stump. So, well, what happened to the growth out of that original stump? The Davidic line had died out. Nothing was left but a stump. But a shoot shall sprout from the stump of Jesse, a new beginning. And from his roots a bud shall blossom. And here we have it. The Ruah Elohim, the Spirit of the Lord, shall be upon him. A spirit, and here are the words, a spirit of wisdom and of understanding, a spirit of counsel and of strength, a spirit of knowledge and of fear of the Lord, and his delight shall be the fear of the Lord. So these are the qualities of God's, of the one chosen by God's Spirit. And we still use those qualities, by the way, in the confirmation liturgy as we describe the type of the gifts that God will give the one being confirmed in the sacrament of confirmation. Isaiah has numerous references to the Spirit of God. Ezekiel, likewise, uh, speaks about a time when God will give his people, and these are the words, a new heart and a new ruhah, a new spirit. And uh, God says, I will put my ruhah, my spirit, within you. And that's the promise. A very late prophet, Joel, uh, prays for the spirit of God to be poured upon all humanity, all humankind. So you have, towards what we call the end of the Old Testament, that deep awareness that there is a yearning that the Ruah, Elohim, God's Spirit, would be on all humankind, the sons and daughters of men and women. So that prepares us for the opening of the New Testament. So with the New Testament, uh, the Spirit of God and the first Gospel to be written, in all likelihood, the Gospel of Mark, it's interesting, Mark's Gospel only mentions the Spirit of God twice. Anybody know where the Spirit is mentioned in Mark's Gospel? At the baptism and the transfiguration. All right, at the baptism, uh, the first reference in the Gospel of Mark to the Spirit. So Mark tells us that Jesus was baptized, and on coming up out of the water, he saw the Spirit descending as a dove descends, and heard a voice from the heavens. You are my beloved Son, with you I am well pleased. So in the Gospel of Mark, Jesus has a, what we would call, an intimate experience of the Father and the Spirit. The voice of the Father speaking to him, he heard it. Mark doesn't tell us anyone else heard it. He saw it, he doesn't tell us anyone else saw the Spirit. In Mark's account, it could be Jesus himself who both sees and hears, but he doesn't refer to anyone else saying or hearing whereas the other Gospels expand that out. Uh, we can also say, by the way, that that's kind of the first moment in the Gospels where you have sort of what we would call the seeds of the doctrine of what we call the Trinity, because there you have the voice of the Father, you have the Son, and you have the Spirit descending as a dove, so what we call a Trinitarian reference. The second reference to the Spirit in Mark's Gospel, then Mark tells us that uh, the Spirit uh, drove Jesus out into the desert wilderness right after his baptism. So those are Mark's two references to the Spirit of God. At once, Mark says, 
the Spirit drove him out into the desert. So, in the sense of the Spirit compelling Jesus to go out into the desert. By the way, Luke didn't like that so well, so he said the Spirit didn't drive him out there. He used a different verb. It led him to the desert or to the wilderness. So, so, uh, so Mark only has two scant references. Uh, the Gospel of Matthew uh, refers to the Spirit uh, in those two particular cases, probably taken from the Gospel of Mark. But he also has, in chapter 10, a reference to the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. And in chapter 12, he quotes Isaiah the prophet, the Spirit of the Lord. And uh, in 1228, which I like this reference, um, They think that Jesus is expelling demons by the power of Beelzebul, the prince of demons. And the reply of Jesus is, if I drive out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your people drive them out? Therefore, they will be your judges. But if it is by the Spirit of God, the Ruach Elohim, that I drive out demons, and in Greek, of course, it's Pneuma, which is the word for spirit. If it is by the Spirit of God that I drive out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. So a reference there clearly to uh, the Spirit of God at work, much as you would refer, by the way, to the Spirit of God in the Old Testament at that point. So those are the references in the Gospel of Matthew. I think it fair to say, then, that Luke, by comparison, refers to the Holy Spirit more frequently eight times during the Gospel itself, and Luke has also written the second narrative, the Acts of the Apostles, which in addition to being the story of the early church, might also be fittingly described as the Gospel of the Holy Spirit, because it begins with the great sequence of Pentecost, which we'll come back to, and it shows the Spirit of God guiding Peter, uh, Paul, and the other apostles in proclaiming the Gospel all along the way. So definitely the early church and the Acts of the Apostles you get a clear sense that the Spirit of God is guiding the early apostolic church. So in the Gospel of Luke, some significant moments. Um, it is by the Spirit that Mary will conceive the child in her. So by the Spirit of God, she will conceive and bear the Son. Simeon uh, in the temple rejoices in the Holy Spirit. Luke will also mention the Spirit at the baptism of Jesus and leading him to the desert. But Luke also, and he's the only one, will mention that after those 40 days in the wilderness, that the Spirit of God led Jesus back to Galilee, out of the desert. So that you get a sense in Luke that there's a more conscious awareness of how the Spirit of God is leading Jesus throughout his ministry. And Jesus himself, in the Gospel of Luke, will quote the prophet Isaiah, in chapter 4, saying, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me. So in Luke's Gospel, Jesus is definitely what we would call the bearer of the Spirit of God. Uh, and then in chapter 10, it says Jesus rejoiced in the Holy Spirit. In chapter 11, he talks about asking for the Holy Spirit. Those who ask for the Holy Spirit, the Father will answer. And uh, in chapter 23, which I think is a very key moment, the end of the Gospel of Luke. On the cross, it was now about noon and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon because of an eclipse of the sun. Then the veil of the temple was torn down in the middle. Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. So you have the sense in Luke that Jesus, conceived by the Holy Spirit, who saw the Spirit descending at his baptism, the Spirit that had led Jesus, by whom he uh, went about doing the good works of God, now he is returning the Spirit to the Father. I commend my spirit, my breath to you. And when he said this, he breathed his last. So the breath of Jesus, his own spirit, uh, is breathed back to the Father at the moment of his death at Calvary. 
So it's a significant moment. It's kind of like the opposite of God breathing into the nostrils of Adam, the breath of life. Now the breath of life of Jesus is given back to the Father and to your hands, Father. I entrust my spirit. John's gospel, however, among the four, has more references to the Holy Spirit uh, than the other three gospels. So he refers to the Holy Spirit in a variety of different ways. Early on, he says, we have to be born of the Spirit, uh, like born again, born anew, or born from above. We also have to be born of the Spirit, of the Ruah, the Numa of God. Um, we must worship the Father in spirit and in truth. He compares the Holy Spirit to living waters with the Samaritan woman at the well. But the pivotal moment when John really reflects on the gift of the Holy Spirit comes at the Last Supper in what we call the Farewell Discourse. And I want to read that little section because it's very, very significant. Um, so at the Last Supper, John is the only one of the four Gospels, by the way, who has Jesus give us an extended farewell, a goodbye, the Last Supper. This is part of what he says. If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another paraclete. The Greek word is parakleo, to call upon. A paraclete to be with you always, the spirit of truth which the world cannot accept because it neither sees nor knows it, but you know it because it remains with you and will be in you. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. So reference to a spirit that will be sent upon the apostolic community. I have told you this while I'm still with you. The paraclete, the advocate, the Holy Spirit that the Father will send in my name, he will teach you everything and remind you of all that I told you. So clear promising after the resurrection that the gift of God's Spirit would be given to the apostolic community, to the church. And he goes on in the next chapter, continuing to reflect on that same thought. When the paraclete or the advocate comes, whom I will send you from the Father, the Spirit of truth that proceeds from the Father, he will also testify to me. And you also testify, because you've been with me from the beginning. And he goes on to say, uh, when he comes, the Spirit of truth will guide you to all truth. He will not speak on his own, but he will speak what he hears. So the Spirit is closely associated in John's Gospel with both the Father and the Son whom the Father and the Son will send once the resurrection happens. And Jesus says, you know, I'm not going to leave you orphans. You're not going to be abandoned. But the Father and I will come. We will make our dwelling place within you. And uh, the word paraclete, by the way, in Greek, is a very difficult word to translate into English. We're not sure exactly its precise meaning. So it's sometimes translated as advocate, in the form of a person who would stand in for us at a trial. So when I go to court, I don't have to defend myself. My advocate or my attorney stands up and represents me. So the, the spirit might be our advocate, uh, might be our protector, our spokesperson. Another way it's been translated is a counselor, a consoler, a comforter. And many translations uh, stick with paraclete or advocate. So. The Spirit has, seems to have a role of uh, comforting, guiding, consoling, teaching, reminding us, and so forth to dwell within us. By the way, in the Gospel of John, does he give us Pentecost Sunday? Does he have the fulfillment of the Spirit coming upon the apostolic community? It's a trick question. He doesn't have it 50 days later. For John, Easter Sunday is also Pentecost Sunday. So John doesn't separate the two events by 50 days. They happen simultaneously. The risen Lord gives the gift of the Holy Spirit on Easter Sunday night. So listen to the text. This is Easter Sunday night on the evening of that first day of the week 
when the doors were locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. When he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord, and Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. And he breathed on them. The breath of the Spirit was breathed on them, just like God breathed into the nostrils of Adam at the beginning of creation. He breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit, whose sins you forgive are forgiven, and whose sins you retain are retained. So for John, the promised coming of the Spirit happens when the risen Lord breathes the Holy Spirit upon the apostles. Uh, it is Luke who gives us uh, a chronological unfolding that on the 50th day in the upper room, uh, the 11 were gathered with, with the mother of Jesus, with Mary, and at that moment, the Spirit, like a strong driving wind, like tongues, like a fire, descended upon the apostles. And Luke, by the way, speaks about Pentecost Sunday as, in a sense, the birthday of the church. It is the transformative moment uh, from disciples who are hiding in fear behind locked doors to bold proclaimers of the gospel. They immediately go out and they begin to proclaim the good news of Jesus. And every single person who's gathered in the city of Jerusalem for Passover from all the nations to which the Jews have been scattered, all the known nations have gathered, and every single one of them hears Peter proclaiming the gospel in his own language. So what does Luke tell us by that? That the Spirit given at Pentecost gives them a boldness in proclaiming the gospel. It also gives them the ability to communicate the good news to people of every language. What Luke is telling us, by the way, is that what happened in Genesis at Babel has now been undone. So at Babel, remember, human beings were trying to storm their way to heaven and build a tower to God, and God recognized they were trying to reach him by pride and self-sufficiency, and he caused their languages to become confused, or Babel, so they could no longer cooperate together. It's a powerful, vivid imagery of what sin does. It divides human beings so that we don't communicate with each other anymore. Where the Spirit of God undoes that, and humanity begins to speak the same language, because it's the language of the Spirit of God's love that brings humanity back together. So it's a powerful undoing of the destructive consequences of sin. So when Pentecost happens, the plan of God's salvation begins to reunite the scattered children of humanity, to bring them back together. That's what's sort of one of the great themes of Pentecost. Uh, all throughout the um, Acts of the Apostles, by the way, as I mentioned before, uh, references to the Spirit. When Stephen is dying, just as Jesus gave his Spirit to the Father in his death, when the first martyr, Stephen, is being martyred, he says, Lord Jesus, receive my Spirit. So he returns his Spirit to Jesus as Jesus returned the Spirit to the Father. So he dies like Jesus dies. Uh, the Spirit speaks to Philip in chapter 8 to Peter in chapter 10, and again in 11. So whenever God wants the early apostolic community to do something, it's the Spirit that's motivating them or pushing them to do it. Uh, and then, of course, uh, Paul uh, receives the Spirit, too, who pushes Paul around as well, or guides him around. So by the way, Paul uh, is also a great master theologian of the Holy Spirit. He speaks throughout his letters about the Holy Spirit. And uh, there are some pivotal points I just want to highlight, some most key ones. In Romans chapter 8, he says that the Spirit has been poured out into our hearts. We've been given a Spirit, Paul will call it, of adoption, so that we too, like Jesus, can cry out, Abba, that is Father. And that's very significant because Paul's letters are in Greek, but that word Abba is in the original Aramaic or Hebrew. So Paul is referring to an ancient connection with the original Christian experience. Once we accept and receive the Spirit of God, 
uh, the Spirit poured out into our hearts, we cry out with Jesus, Abba, Father. Powerful moment. Uh, Paul also mentions in that very same chapter that you know none of us knows how to pray as we should. So the Spirit helps us to pray in inexpressible groanings. Uh, so we do not know how to pray without the assistance of the Holy Spirit. One of his powerful points of reference is his first letter to the Corinthians. If you read chapters 12, 13, and 14, Paul there speaks very eloquently about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And he enumerates those gifts. And what is one of the most common gifts of the Holy Spirit in the Corinthian community? Anybody know? It's called glossolalia, speaking in tongues. So people in Corinth were able to speak in tongues. And if you go to the charismatic prayer meetings or to Pentecostal churches, uh, people to this day still speak in tongues. And it's not a language that's understandable on the part of the human person, uh, unless you've been given the gift of discernment of spirits where you can understand the tongues. Uh, and I've known uh, several people through my years as a priest who have not been given that gift, that special ability of the Holy Spirit. So an ability to speak in a, a language that is not any language of the world, but the language of the Spirit of God. Paul, by the way, will go on to say um, that every gift of the Holy Spirit is given for some common benefit. In other words, for the good of the church as a whole. They're not meant to be private gifts for us alone, but they're meant to do something to build up the body of Christ. And Paul said there are a variety of gifts in the church of the Holy Spirit. Gifts of administration, of teaching, of leading, uh, gifts of proclaiming the gospel, and so forth. But then he goes further and he says, but what are the most important gifts of the Spirit? What are the greatest gifts? Chapter 13, you all know it by heart probably. In the end, there are three of the most important. Faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these, Paul will say, is love. It's the greatest gift of the Holy Spirit, is love itself. And Paul is beautiful in that section of, of 1 Corinthians. We, we know it from weddings, most of them. Love is patient, love is kind, and so forth. And love will endure. It will, it will last beyond anything else. And, and then Paul goes on to say, I can, you know, I, I can have speak in tongues, but if I don't have love, I'm nothing. You know, and, and I can prophesy. And if I have faith enough, enough to even move mountains, but I don't have love, then I've lost everything. So for Paul, the decisive gift of the Spirit is in fact love. In his letter to the Galatians, he will also uh, speak about how we human beings are caught between the flesh and the Spirit. And the flesh is our orientation away from God's will for us. Our spirit is moving toward God. And it's there in his letter to the Galatians that, God, uh, that Paul speaks about the fruits of the Spirit. And I love the fruits of the Spirit. I can never remember them. I should memorize them. Um, so what the, the, the fruits of the Spirit are love, joy, some of you know, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against things like this, Paul says, there is no law. So in other words, anytime you're living the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, you're living according to the Spirit of God. So that's just a bit of a taste of some of the ways that the Holy Spirit is manifested in sacred scripture. Uh, we believe, by the way, that the church itself is always continuously guided by the Holy Spirit and that each of the baptized, when we are baptized, we first receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. It is deepened in the sacrament and sealed of confirmation. So each individual Christian, we also have been given the Spirit of God, who is always trying to guide and direct and lead us, as the Spirit directed Peter and Paul and Stephen, and even Jesus. So we're, we're supposed to be as... Uh, God's beloved children docile to God's Spirit, allowing God to use us 
and the Spirit of God to move us where the Spirit wants to move us. So that's a uh, docility to the Holy Spirit is a gift of humility that helps us to become the people that God created us to be. Uh, so how many of you all regularly pray to the Holy Spirit? Okay, a lot of you. Um, so um, when I was young, as I mentioned, I would often just pray to God. You know, God. I was probably thinking of God the Father or the Trinity. Or Lord. And uh, Lord, would you please help me? Uh, or to Jesus. Now, more recently, I do. A lot of times I do pray to Jesus. Uh, but there are, there are a couple of privileged moments when I'm always asking the Holy Spirit for help. One of the moments when I'm always interceding the Holy Spirit is in my ministry as a priest. So when I'm doing something and I'm not clear on where to go, and how to proceed, what words to speak, I pray to the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, come. Give me the right words. Help me to know what your will is for me today in this matter. Uh, I may have told you all that. Did I tell you the story about the woman I had to call the telephone once? And um, something had happened, and, uh, and, I, and I knew I needed to try to heal the relationship. And I said, I don't know what to say, God, but come Holy Spirit, give me the right words. You know? I called, and she said, I'm so glad you called. And then she started talking. And uh, I was still unsure, how do I best approach this God? Please, Holy Spirit, give me the right words. And, and she paused, and I was like, Holy Spirit, come. And she then she continued to talk. And she continued to talk, and she continued to talk. And she said, I just appreciate so much your calling, Father. Thank you, and I'll talk to you later. Click, that was it. <laughs> so, so maybe the Holy Spirit answered, but I wasn't supposed to say very much of anything. You know, so I just don't listen, you know. So, um, so yes, the Spirit of God is good to call upon when we need wisdom, when we need courage, uh, I know I'm supposed to do this, God, but I'm afraid. Come, Holy Spirit, give me courage. Uh, the other time, by the way, that I was a priest, that I always ask the Holy Spirit for assistance is uh, in preparation to preach the gospel at Mass, particularly the weekend liturgy. So whenever I'm at the Eucharist, I'm listening to God's Word being proclaimed at the Sunday liturgy. I'm humbly employing the Holy Spirit uh, to give power to the Word that is to be proclaimed. Uh, so that the, the seeds of God are planted where God desires them to be planted. So, so it's always good to ask the Holy Spirit for assistance in important moments like that. The other thing, too, is um, the Holy Spirit of God uh, shows up in consolations. I like your description of you feel the Holy Spirit as, a, as an embrace. Or a hug. So the Spirit of God is a comforter, a consoler, and sometimes in our moments of need for consolation from God, it is the Spirit who gently whispers in us words of consolation. So we might be deeply troubled about something, and we're in turmoil, and we don't know what to do, and suddenly this gentle peace descends on us, like, like gentleness of do. Well, that is the work of the Holy Spirit consoling us inwardly. Uh, there are also, the Holy Spirit does what I call promptings. I have a good friend that talked about how the Holy Spirit prompted her uh, a lot of times. And what do I mean by prompt? It bumped her, nudged her to do something. So she was driving her car one day and the Holy Spirit started nudging her you know, you need to check on so-and-so. You need to check on so-and-so. Finally, she just picked up her phone and called so-and-so. And the person who answered the phone said, I am so glad you called. I needed to talk to somebody. And uh, she said, that was the prompt Holy Spirit prompting me. You know, I don't know where that thought came from to call that particular person at that particular time. But the Holy Spirit prompted her. So the more attuned that we become to the Holy Spirit, the more the Spirit will prompt us guide us and lead us to do things that we might not think of on our own. So that's the gift of what God's Spirit does for us in given moments. All right, any questions or observations tonight about God's Spirit? I know God had to 
um, there was a group that met our house, a uh, Catholic group. I can't even remember the name. Had several. Anyway, one time um, during this session, I happened to think of a picture, a picture of Our Lady of Guadalupe. We weren't studying Mary. Nothing was even mentioned about Mary. And I thought, I wonder, I had bought a picture of Our Lady of Guadalupe when I went to Mexico once. Mm -hmm. And I had just rolled it up and put it in the top of my closet. So I went, and I thought, I'm going to see if that picture's still there. And it was. And I thought, well, I'll be on. And I don't, nothing was even mentioned about Mary. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I took the picture down, rolled it up, put it on the table in the back room. I'll get it framed one of these days. The very next week, the story of my mother was on. And I thought, wow. <laughs> Somebody was preparing you, yes. Yeah. A moment of the Holy Spirit yes. you know, guiding you. It's beautiful. Well, you know, the, the procedural groups, maybe in this parish, invoke the Holy Spirit. In the beginning of their meeting. Yes, uh, the Holy Spirit is referred to in the Brasillo prayer book. They use the prayer of the Holy Spirit before every talk on the weekend, too. If, when we were talking about who we pray to, but if you're saying to one, are we not, are we not still all we're talking right, about? Right, because God is one. Anytime you address any of the persons of the Trinity, you're speaking to all of them. Yeah, it's interesting because um, um, when you see the movie The Shack, so the main human character says to the, the three persons of the Trinity, I think we're at table at that point, says, so which one of you are God? And I'll say together, I am. You know, or, you know, so, yeah, so, yes, exactly. So, in fact, anytime I address the Son, I'm also speaking to the Father and the Spirit and vice versa, all the way around. So, they're one God. Yeah, three divine persons. That's, of course, that's a mystery, you know, so. My question is about confirmation, because we have it at 8th grade or 13, 14, right now there. And there's kind of a misunderstanding that it's like a right of adulthood or something like that. But, you know, Eastern rites have it, like, at the same time as baptism. So what is the thing in between not opening the door to those gifts of the Holy Spirit in infancy, but waiting? Right, so... Um, uh, the separation of the ritual moment of baptism and of confirming later in a child's life like the eighth grade like we do often these days is what you might call a historical accident. So in the beginning of the church, uh, when a person was baptized, almost always they were immediately confirmed. But as the church got bigger in size, I'm compacting a lot of history in a very short window of time, and dioceses became bigger, they wanted the bishop in the Latin Rite, the Western Church, to be the minister of confirmation. But he enabled priests and deacons to do baptisms, but the goal was to get around as quickly as possible to seal the baptism with confirmation and chrismation. And in fact, when you study the legislation in the first 1,500 years or so of the church's history, there are synods over and over again telling bishops they must get around as soon as possible to seal the newly baptized. So the idea was that they should do it quickly. But soon days became weeks, became months, became years, and then they had to have legislation. They couldn't receive uh, Eucharist until they had been confirmed, and then eventually confirmation got after First Communion. And in the 20th century, it moved quickly later. It used to be in the early part of the 20th century, even closer to First Communion, around third grade. And it moved like to the eighth grade, and then by the time the 1960s came along, they were sometimes even moving it into high school, and because it was physically separated in time from baptism, it was seen as like a sacrament of adult commitment or transition into adulthood, which in fact was not its purpose or intent originally. So, um, so the Eastern churches still preserve the connection when you're an infant, you're baptized, confirmed, and you receive first Eucharist. So the baby gets the Eucharist in a little spoon with a consecrated uh, precious blood with a bit of bread in it, consecrated body of Christ, and swallows the Eucharist together, body and blood. Um, and we still, by the way, we preserve that original ordering with adults on Easter Vigil. 
So, and there are some who would say, we want to go back to moving confirmation as close to baptism as possible. So yeah, insightful historical theological question on world and one. But you know, once you do that, people don't want to give it up. You know, there are these categories saying, no, 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 this thing is great now. You know, so, and so it's hard to move back in time. You said it wasn't originally Uh, so originally, um, it was the sealing of one's baptism. So it was one ritual event. So you were baptized in water, then anointed with sacred chrism, confirmed simultaneously. So it was a sacrament of Christian initiation. But you baptism, you still get the oil. Oh yeah, so isn't that weird? So we want to hold on to, that's the oil of catechumens on the chest, the chrism we use on the head of the child after they're baptized. So it's what we call a remnant of confirmation left in the baptismal rite that really is meant to be later. That's very strange how these things develop ritually speaking. Um, so yeah, yeah, we still have a, a kind of a... And so the Eastern rites, by the way, the way they saw the connection with the bishop was the sacred chrism must be consecrated by the bishop himself in the Eastern rites. So even though priests can baptize and confirm, they still use the chrism consecrated by the bishop. And in the West, we still do that most of the time. So the bishop does the blessing of uh, the consecration of chrism and blessing of oils during Holy Week, which we use in the sacraments, including confirmation. What simple explanation would you give to a child when they say, what is the Holy Spirit? To chip like children and stuff. <coughs> Just I would say to a child, you know, the Spirit of God is the presence of God who is always with you and in you and surrounding you. I was close to God because the Spirit of God is with you. That's what I would say. Where, where did you change from Holy Ghost? Oh, that's a good question. So, yeah, we used to say Holy Ghost before re retranslation. Uh, that was retranslated in the 1960s. Uh, because the word Geist, which is the German word for spirit, uh, was translated into English, came into English as ghost, and originally it had a more general meaning of a spirit, like Geist still does in German. But in English, the word ghost almost got narrowed down to like a supernatural being that sometimes is scary and frightening unless it's Casper the Friendly Ghost. So ghost had a different meaning. Spirit had more of this, actually a better translation of pneuma and ruah than ghost would be, because what we mean by ghost today is not spirit as much. Although we still have the archaic elements of it in our language. So we said that fellow gave up his ghost, it means he died, he breathed his last, he gave up his spirit. So we still, we wouldn't even think of the Holy Ghost anymore if we didn't have that famous hymn. Come Holy Ghost. That keeps reminding us, of course. And we all know it means the Holy Spirit, of course, you know. Yeah. Does the church frown upon speaking in tongues? The church does not frown upon speaking in tongues. Um, I think that St. Paul in his letter to the Corinthians gives good sound counsel about the gifts of the Holy Spirit, including the gift of tongues, which is that as long as it's, as it's in service of the church, for the building up of the body of Christ, and as long as love is the prevailing reason that one would exercise any of the gifts of the Spirit, then it does not frown upon it. Uh, but, you know, obviously, um, uh, one has to be mindful of, uh, if it's not a charismatic liturgy, for example, that praying in tongues <coughs> might be distracting to other members of the community, unless they're used to it. So context when and where that gift is exercised very important. Do we have a charismatic group that meets out at St. Ignatius? We do. We have a charismatic group that meets at St. Ignatius, and there may be other churches as well. I don't know about all the locations. And every year we have a Catholic charismatic conference. So. And they used to meet at St. Henry's. Okay, I didn't know that many years ago. All right, our hour is up, believe it or not. So um, next week we will talk about the church, its meaning and mission, and the Holy Spirit to the church itself. So let's close with a glory be.
Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall 